Welcome back to Dornsife Dialogues. April is Earth Month, a time to both celebrate our favorite planet and to focus on our increasingly delicate relationship with it. As we confront the escalating challenges of climate change, innovative strategies like carbon capture and sequestration are gaining traction as potential pathways to reduce atmospheric carbon. These approaches could play a pivotal role in our efforts to mitigate the impacts of global warming. And here at USC Dornsife, we have scientists bringing tremendous creativity to the development of technology that could be used in this way. But before we bring in the bulldozers, it's important for us to carefully think through how and where we are building new infrastructure to make sure that we don't create new societal problems in place of the ones we're trying to address. It's also important to make sure that we engage and listen to our scientists who can help us ensure that we are choosing sequestration methods that are safe, secure, and long-term, and that don't carry risks of disastrous leaks or failures. Today, we will hear from three of the experts who will help us get this right. Our moderator, Professor Joe Arvai, is the Dana and David Dornsife Professor of Psychology and Director of the Wrigley Institute for Environment and Sustainability. A behavioral scientist who focuses on environmental decision-making, Professor Arvai's research explores sustainable development, environmental policy, and the intersection of science and decision-making. He is a former member of the U.S. EPA's Chartered Science Advisory Board and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences Board on Environmental Change and Society. We have a terrific conversation coming up, so I'll hand it over to Professor Arvai to introduce our panelists. Thank you, as always, for tuning in and enjoy the program. Well, thank you, Dean Miller, and welcome to all of you joining us for this Dornsife uh, Dialogue. You know, it was a long time ago that uh, I was an undergraduate student, but it was right around the time when climate change started to hit the mainstream. It was the late 1980s. And, you know, the conversation back then amongst a lot of my peers uh, was, you know, if we can put the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, why can't we just take it out? And that was a question that seemed a bit like science fiction at the time. But of course, now climate change is very real. It's very clear and it's very present. If you think about all the things that are happening around the world at the moment, oceans as hot as hot tubs in the in the Atlantic, uh, extreme weather, uh, natural hazards all hitting us in the face. It feels like it's a time to actually revisit the question of withdrawing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the good news is we've moved from science fiction to actual present day reality. But as you might imagine, any new technology brings with it new challenges and lots of questions. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So joining me in the Stornsife Dialogue is my friend and colleague, Will Berelson. He's the Paxson Offield Professor of Earth Sciences and Environmental Studies here at USC Dornsife where he has taught and conducted research for over 40 years. He has crossover titles of geochemist, chemical oceanographer, atmospheric chemist, and geobiologist. His work broadly focuses on bio, geochemical cycling in the ocean, and he's conducting pioneer work on developing ocean in situ devices. His recent work is on calcium carbonate dissolution kinetics, of interest to us today, CO2 sequestration, and the urban carbon cycle. So welcome, Will. We're also joined by Anu Khan. She's the entrepreneur in residence at Carbon 180, which is a US federal policy NGO focused on building a just, equitable, and highly accountable carbon removal sector capable of eliminating gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere. As an entrepreneur in residence, Anu is focused on building a new initiative to create, maintain, and advocate for the adoption of rigorous standards across carbon removal science, industry, and policy. And she holds degrees in chemistry from Princeton and Caltech. Welcome, Anu. So let's get right into it. I think a lot of folks are tuning in, Will and Anu, to talk about uh, and hear about carbon removal technology. So can we just start with the really basic stuff? And let me ask you, what, what are we talking about when we talk about carbon dioxide removal? I can start us off on that. So first and foremost, thank you for uh, inviting me to join. I'm really excited to be here and, and always happy to chat about carbon removal since I'm kind of obsessed with this topic. Uh, so from an IPCC perspective, like top level climate science, what is carbon removal? The IPCC defines carbon removal as technologies, practices, and approaches. So things that humans are doing that remove and durably store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. 
two important things there. Remove from the atmosphere. So it's not point source. It's not emissions reduction. It's really, it's already in the atmosphere and we're pulling it back down. And then the second piece is durably store. There's some ongoing conversation about what that means. And so at Carbon 180, we think of this as either sort of socially or legally durable. So say you have a hundred year monitoring requirement for this carbon or physically durable, like it's thermodynamically very stable, like it's a mineral in the ocean. Um, when we think about it, sort of, that's the, the high level definition, but what kind of things are carbon removal? People are often talking about things like soil carbon. Our soils, healthy soils, are full of carbon, organic and inorganic carbon. Often people are familiar with forestry types of carbon removal, so afforestation, reforestation, improved forest management. But there's also this broader set of ecosystem restoration projects that can be carbon removal, so mangroves, wetlands, seagrasses. Um, those are usually considered to be kind of the, the short duration carbon removal. So the carbon is in plants, it's in ecosystems, but it could be reversed by something like a fire. Then there's a whole set of what people call durable or permanent carbon removal solutions. So that's things like biomass carbon removal and storage. So you get the biomass and you convert it into a form that is really stable. Or things like direct air capture. You have large sets of fans that are pulling CO2 directly out of uh, the atmosphere and storing it in uh, geologic reservoirs or underground. Um, and then there's a whole emerging set of solutions that I think Will could probably speak to you better than I can that's around alkalinity management. It's this natural weathering process that happens on geologic timescales, and we're speeding it up to happen on human timescales to account for all the human timescale damage we've done to the environment. Yeah, I, that's terrific. And if I could also sort of complement that um, wonderful introduction with with the following that is the earth uh, the earth system has always known how to take care of excess co2 it's been doing it for four billion years the earth had a much higher co2 atmosphere in the past and has on its own of course figured out how to mitigate atmospheric co2 the earth system naturally regulates how much co2 is in the atmosphere it does that by reactions between CO2 in the atmosphere and rainwater that falls onto the earth and hits uh, rocks on the earth and weathers the rocks that convert the CO2 in the water into bicarbonate. Bicarbonate uh, in the streams and the rivers end up in the ocean and hence the CO2 from the atmosphere works its way through this process and ends up as bicarbonate in the ocean for hundreds of thousands of years, a very durable storage method. The earth has figured this out. The problem is the earth uh, runs this process, does this chemistry at its own pace, which is quite slow. Whereas we've been putting CO2 into the atmosphere very quickly over the last 100 years, extremely quickly. And so it's figuring out how to get that CO2 out of the atmosphere, how to stop putting more CO2 into the atmosphere is what CDR is really all about. So um, I've got questions already. Um, so I want to go back to what Anu said. I, when I started working on this, it was maybe around 2010, 2011, and we were working on CCS, carbon capture and sequestration. And there was a lot of interest in capturing carbon dioxide at smokestacks, um, you know, collecting it and then piping it underground. But I thought that was CDR. What am I missing? Why Why the semantic differences? And I could throw in other acronyms like DAC, CCU, like it suddenly becomes a bit of an alphabet soup, which I think contributes to why this is so confusing. But either of you, what do we, I mean, do we really need all these semantic differences when we talk about carbon dioxide removal? Yeah, um, I'm also happy to, to jump in here. Um, the, it is confusing. There's an alphabet soup of acronyms that are sort of overlapping. They use the same word, but they use them differently. Um, so I think really the, the two big categories that we're talking about here are reductions and removals. So reductions is this source was about to put some CO2 into the atmosphere, but we stopped it. We capped it. We didn't let that CO2 go into the atmosphere. And it's super important to note that reducing emissions, decarbonization, preventing more emissions from entering the atmosphere is the bulk of the work in climate. It, we just have to stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere. So we definitely don't want to talk about removal as if it's 
uh, an excuse to keep emitting or if it's um, something that allows us to keep doing both climate and environmentally harmful practices. So category number one, reduction, decarbonization, stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere. The second category is removals. So that's really recognizing that we have done harm by putting CO2 into the atmosphere that is causing warming today, and we should start drawing that back down. There are three main reasons that the IPCC specifically talks about using removal. So taking CO2 that is already in the atmosphere and pulling it back down. The first is around this topic of hard to abate or residual emissions. There's gonna be some stuff like land use change, some things in agriculture, some industries, that are gonna be really, really hard in the near term to fully decarbonize. And yet we still need to achieve net zero, we need to stabilize global temperatures, we need to stop causing this global harm. And so people talk about using removals for that purpose. There's a little bit of CO2 that's gonna be super, super hard to get rid of, let's balance it with removals. The other two categories that folks talk about are really removing large quantities of legacy emissions. So if you look at some of these emission scenarios, projections, you see us going past 1.5 C or 2 C in some scenarios, but the Paris Agreement says we really got to stabilize in 1.5 C, maybe 2 C. So people talk about removals to draw us back down under that temperature limit. Maybe we temporarily overshoot. We really, really don't want to do that because even temporary overshoots are quite dangerous. But if we do, we want to come back down to those safer temperatures. Um, and then there's a third, I think, really important and big category around legacy emissions. How much do we want to draw down closer to pre-industrial levels, particularly when we think about how unequally distributed climate harms are, right? So it's not the same in the U.S. and South Asia, where my family family is from, right? Like the, the impacts are wildly different. The temperature swings are wildly different. And so this third category is there's a trillion tons of CO2 that we've already put in the atmosphere. Can we start drawing that down as well? So I got to I will go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, got, yeah, it's all yours. Thanks. So um, when I first started working on this, I said it was, you know, around 2010, 2011, something like that. We did a lot of um, stakeholder interviews and focus groups just to try and understand what people thought about kind of carbon dioxide removal. And we heard lots of really interesting things. Um, one of them was that people sort of assumed it was like kind of blowing up a balloon, that we would capture CO2 and that we would sort of like pump it into the earth and it would sort of be kind of down there in, you know, caves and other kinds of geological formations as just sort of like gas under pressure. And then there were fears about whether well, it would be these explosive CO2 events like a volcano where all the CO2 would come rushing out. We heard concerns like, you know, CO2 is going to end up in my carrots and my potatoes and they're going to taste like soda. Um, so there was a lot of like misinformation and misconceptions out there. I actually, a friend of mine asked me just, I think it was yesterday, the day before, like, you know, when you pump it down there, what happens? And I waved my hands and talked about, you know, bicarbonate and solids and slurries. Can one of you maybe will just, just clean up the mess for me and tell me what happens when you put CO2 in the earth to start? And then we can talk about the ocean after. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you know, CO2 has been pumped into the earth, into the rocks that lie beneath our feet. For a long time, I'm not sure if it's 50 or even 100 years ago, but it's certainly been at least 50 years that that um, the oil companies figured out that they could both remove some CO2 from what they were pumping out of the ground and then turn around and pump that back down into the ground. And that would actually help them recover even more oil. That's called enhanced oil recovery, E-O-R. But... Um, the point being, you can you can pump uh, liquid CO2 into the ground where it will uh, react with water that's in the that's contained within the the pore space of the rocks, and that CO2 then will um, reside within those pore spaces within those rocks, and yet slowly because that liquid with the dissolved CO2 in it is slightly more buoyant than that liquid is naturally by itself, that more buoyant fluid, like a cork in, a, in, in water, will eventually rise. And so the concern is this CO2 we pump down into the ground can make its way back out of the ground. 
And then what good is that? We haven't really gotten rid of the CO2 if it comes back out again. So part of the uh, issue with getting CO2 removal to work underground is you've got to have a, a place where that CO2 can rise, but never make it all the way out. And so there are a few places where that can happen. And that's where you've got your best chance of sequestering CO2 underground. Now, I was at a, a meeting not that long ago. It was um, January or something. I was at a, an exhibit that I think Climeworks, the Swiss company, put on. And they had cores, like rock cores. And they were, you know, you know, showing these off, saying, look, there's you know, captured CO2 in these pores. How, so does it turn, can it turn solid somehow? Can, I mean, yeah, it feels like yeah. it can. Yes, if it, if it encounters the right mineral, uh, which you know exists in certain places, but not in that many places. So you can't just drill a well anywhere and have this happen. But if you drill the well in the right place, and perhaps Iceland is the best example, the CO2 you pump down then reacts with a certain type of mineral within these certain types of rocks. It's called olivine for the most part. Uh, then the CO2 can turn into a solid. It can turn into a mineral, calcium carbonate and other minerals, which actually you know, solidify that carbon into something that's really quite stable. So yeah, it can happen if you're in the right place. I like the sound of that. Anu, is, is the US the right place for this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I was actually going to say um, there are a few places in the world where folks are actively working on this technology, sort of uh, in situ mineralization is what it's called. And it's really cool because it's opening up possibilities outside of the U.S. and outside of Europe where a lot of the carbon removal development is happening. There are some projects in the U.S. in the Pacific Northwest in particular, also maybe off the coast of the Pacific Northwest. So there are places where the U.S. has this geology. The U.S. does, however, have a lot of the uh, first type of geology that uh, Will was talking about that it lets us inject liquid CO2 underground. Um, but this newer technology that solidifies carbon, um, there are projects under development in Kenya, in Oman. So we're seeing this sort of globalization of carbon removal and carbon storage that's really exciting. Whoa. So I'm now, it's fun being the moderator. I kind of want, I, I feel like I know a little bit about this, enough to be dangerous, but it's so fun to be around the two of you who know way more. And what you just said, both of you, is raising even more questions for me. So on the one hand, um, I want to know, I mean, if we're going to be doing this in countries like Kenya and, you know, you know, countries in the global south where, you know, we should have a lot of concerns, I, I want to know, first of all, is this safe? Like, are we subjecting people to a risk that we shouldn't be subjecting them to? And then secondly, is it fair and equitable when we do this, like I, the last thing I want to do is work, you know, in places in the United States or elsewhere around the world where we've, you know, we've been less than scrupulous, shall we say, about our methods for extracting resources and the damage we've left behind. And then now here we go, like, hey, we're back and we'd like to do this in your backyard now. And we're going to start injecting CO2 into the earth. I just want to make sure um, that I could like confidently tell my friends that we're not making, you know, one mess and then kind of making an even bigger mess later with carbon removal. Yeah, I'm, I'm throwing that to you, Anu. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of uh, thoughts about that. So I think a um, couple of things. I really appreciate the question because Carbon colonialism is absolutely a thing and how the voluntary carbon markets operate today. We have seen it particularly around forestry projects, displacement of indigenous people, um, projects being developed with the promise of um, distributing uh, financial and economic benefits to communities that are protecting forests and that really not happening. Project developers pulling out big uh, Guardian, uh, New Yorker exposés on this topic. So it is absolutely a thing that we should be careful about. And I think it's also something where there's an enormous opportunity for technical transfer, collaboration internationally, and an opportunity for um, redistributive justice and climate justice, really, fundamentally, where we can think about building, we can think about not just, you know, extracting resources. These are places where there are forests and we can sell them for carbon credits. We can think about building new industries that are going to be hopefully, you know, billion, trillion dollar industries across the globe and creating new economic opportunities. And one thing that I think about a lot is, can we build some of these more um, 
engineered novel approaches globally as well, instead of just sort of being like, well, it has to be in the US. Can we distribute the opportunity, the economic opportunity that's emerging? And there's a really active conversation around this in the sort of UN um, international, I think it's called uh, International Trading Mitigations, um, where you know, can we actually redistribute funds from the global north to the global south to take on this activity that is fundamentally about climate justice and have, you know, global north countries essentially pay for their historical emissions and their legacy of pollution? That's interesting. I want to, but I want to go back to the original kind of question, because to me, when I hear you say, you know, billion, trillion dollar industry, new opportunities, new technology, I can't help but go back again, back to my undergrad and graduate school days when we were using a lot of those same adjectives to talk about nuclear power. And I'm not saying that this is anything like nuclear power, but the big concern around nuclear power was safety. So I, I just got to know, Will, is this is this safe? You're doing it. I mean, I like you're a nice guy. I don't think you're putting us in any danger. But tell me for real, is it safe? Yeah, I'm not that nice a guy, and, and I'm actually not doing it. Um, no, I don't. I'm not involved with getting CO2 and rocks to interact and form these minerals. I think it's a challenge in a couple of ways we haven't mentioned yet. It's really hard for me to imagine doing that at the scale at which we need to remove CO2. Yes, you can do that in Iceland um, and pump a certain amount of CO2 down into the rocks. Yes, you could do that at other locations. Now, if you had enough locations, it would begin to scale. But also imagine this, I'm sure the viewers can too. You're pumping in a CO2, it's interacting with a rock and forming a mineral. You pump in more CO2 and now it's got to get past the mineral that it formed and react with the rock to form the next mineral. And now you've got more mineral blocking the way for this reaction to happen. In other words, it kind of is a diminishing return in a, in a way that would make it less and less efficient and so I don't know that this thing, this process could scale in quite the same way as some other processes of CDR could scale. Love to hear what Anu has to, has to, um, has to say about that. And I'd love yeah. for someone to tell me if this is safe. You guys haven't answered my question yet. We're not <laughs> leaving today until someone does. Oh, um, is it safe? safe in the sense of um like what do you mean by safe like i mean this you. isn't gonna like there isn't gonna be like a co2 explosion people aren't gonna you know um it's not gonna yeah you know, it's not gonna bubble up through their taps it's not going to you know i even heard in a recent round of stakeholder interviews we did it's not going to suck all the co2 out of the atmosphere and stop photosynthetic processes like are, we're not talking about like something that's like a, a risky geoengineering kind of gambit I think. So uh, I would love to hear from Will as well, but I would say with respect to those concerns, CDR is quite safe. Of course, there will be CO2 infrastructure. There is CO2 infrastructure being built for not just carbon removal, but also um, point source carbon capture. That is sometimes in places where there has been um, historical development of heavy industry, petrochemical industry. So in the sense of are we sometimes seeing an overlap between CDR and infrastructure that's been associated with pollution heavy industries in the past? Yes. So I think there's a really real concern there. Um, but to your specific questions around um, explosions or uh, things bubbling up, I'd say by and large, the evidence suggests that CDR is quite safe today. Um, we know a lot about the subsurface. Um, we know a lot about injecting CO2. We're learning more all the time. Um, so the, the actual carbon removal part of the process is quite safe. Phew. Okay. Scalability. <laughs> I know, it took you so long to pull that out of us, one of us to say like it's safe. I'm, I'm tenacious though. So scalability. Um, Will, I had no idea. Again, I'm learning so much. Scalability of sort of terrestrial CDR. Do, should we have concerns, Anu? Will, go ahead. I'll, I can jump in. Uh, yeah, scalability is is really the the, the uh, you know eight hundred pound question right there. Um, you can imagine scalability if there were enough locations and enough uh, infrastructure to 
get the CO2 to these locations where it could then be sequestered by pumping it into these rocks? I'm not sure the answer, Jill, but I don't think this is going to scale terribly well, especially at you know the kind of cost uh, price point that other methods might might arrive at. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not going to uh, hit that price point. And if, we haven't started talking about money yet, but we know that that's also underlying a lot of this uh, conversation as well. So I, I do want to talk about money, but I did want to hear Anu's response to your scalability challenge. Yeah, I think it's important when talking about scalability to zoom out a layer from specific CDR pathways, technologies, storage mechanisms to that overarching goal, removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it durably. When we're talking about gigaton scale CDR, we're not talking about one monolithic solution. Pretty much everyone I know is talking about a portfolio of solutions. There are certain places, certain times where there is a, a practice that will remove carbon from the atmosphere. It might also generate co-benefits. It might also um, plug into existing infrastructure. So it's really about understanding what are the suite of options where are we trying to deploy it and what's kind of the right option for the right place at the right time? And coming from a policy background, really thinking about how you enable that local decision making, how you use the technical expertise of the federal government, the national lab system to help support communities and municipalities in making these choices. What kind of carbon removal is right for this community? It's not one monolithic answer. So that's that's a great segue. Will, I apologize. I was a little uh, imprecise with my language when I said you're doing this, but you are doing a version of this. So if it's not scalable, perhaps in a terrestrial place, or if there are going to be scalability challenges, shall we say, um, what about the ocean? And tell us a little bit about what you're doing over there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought I knew gave a, a really beautiful answer about this. Uh, we, we need multiple approaches. There's absolutely uh, no question that this this problem is not going to be addressed by a single uh, approach, a single methodology. But of course, the scalability is that we all want to remove a lot of CO2. And um, so the ocean is large, covers 70% of the surface of the earth. We know it averages 3,000 meters uh, deep. We know the ocean contains uh, 50 times more carbon than does the atmosphere. It has a huge capacity for taking carbon and um, it's demonstrated because we're putting CO2 into the ocean today of the 10 gigatons roughly of CO2 that are being emitted by fossil fuel use. Uh, the ocean is taking up three, uh, two to three of those gigatons just by sucking it up into the surface ocean. So the ocean has the capacity to do this. It is doing this. And the question is uh, and something that I've uh, been studying for quite a while, but others are very much uh, engaged in this as well. Can you make the ocean more receptive to take up more CO2? And so there are various approaches that involve what's called marine CDR, obviously using the ocean as a repository uh, for, for, um, to, to take up more CO2. And again, what the ocean does with the CO2 is converts it to bicarbonate, and that's the more durable uh, uh, component of carbon that stays in the ocean, doesn't turn back into CO2 and then go back into the atmosphere again. So you asked me about what I do is um, it's more about targeting an industry, which is the shipping industry, and trying to convert the exhaust CO2 from ships into bicarbonate uh, by reacting that CO2 with a mineral calcium carbonate. In short, my idea and the process that we're working on is basically taking a Tums. When you put a Tums in your tummy, it's made of calcium carbonate and it neutralizes the acid in your tummy. And so we wanna neutralize the CO2 from a smokestack with calcium carbonate, the Tums reaction or Rolades if you prefer. And, and let that um, product bi be bicarbonate, which it is, and that bicarbonate is a neutral compound that goes back into the ocean. That's that's one idea that we have. There are many other marine CDR methodologies. Is this what we refer to when we talk about enhanced rock weathering? Is this the same thing, or is it different? It's it's a little bit different, and, and again, it's a lot of this. Uh, um, different initials for different ways of doing this. What we're doing is called accelerated weathering. 
So we're trying to make this reaction of CO2 plus water plus limestone happen quickly, hence the word accelerated. Enhanced rock weathering is a term that's generally used for the idea that other types of rocks, limestone, but mainly other types of rocks that are more like the uh, olivine rich rocks that are found in Iceland, for example, those types of rocks get ground, ground up into small grains and those grains uh, thrown out into the ocean or poured out on the beach will slowly suck up CO2 as <laughs> well. And that's that's considered um, uh, uh, enhanced, enhanced rock weathering. Exactly. Right. Fascinating. Okay, so I got I you know you you talked about the eight hundred pound kind of question. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the million dollar question now. I mean, this all sounds terribly terribly expensive. The last I checked, and you know, this was a month ago, uh, but I think the global average kind of price of carbon dioxide, the global average price of carbon dioxide, I think was around $4 a ton. That's what it was sort of selling for in the carbon marketplace. Um, I've heard from people who work in this industry that maybe $150 a ton might be the break-even point. I'm kind of pulling these numbers out of the air based on memory, but long and short of it, even if it's 100 and not 150 or 70 and not 100, there's a big gap between four and any of those numbers. So I'm wondering, how much does this cost? How much is it going to cost? Are we going to be able to afford this? Are do you know? Do we have no choice but to to make it? Can we afford not to do this? So I'm I'm very curious about the cost question. And you know, I knew you and I have talked before about zero sum games in in economies. That you know, a dollar you spend over here is a dollar you don't spend over there. So if this is really costly. How are we going to pay for this at the expense of other things that we might need to pay for? Or am I thinking about this the wrong way? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, there's actually a report that came out today from the Rhodium Group that said uh, U.S. 2050 goals, current estimates would be $100 billion per year uh, in 2050 for carbon removal. So it is potentially a lot of money. Um, the market development market shaping problem for carbon removal is really interesting because unlike other green technologies like solar, which produces electricity, um, there isn't a natural market for carbon removal. It's just pollution cleanup. There isn't like, well, I have the CO2 now, I get to use it for something. Uh, the actual market for CO2 is quite small. Um, so what we're talking about is really creating a whole new market for a public good. And that raises a lot of interesting questions. Uh, who's going to pay for it? What is the mechanism? I think there's a few different ways that you could think about um, paying for carbon removal at scale. Most folks that I know really arrive at something that looks like a policy-driven demand. Essentially, eventually, governments have to say, you don't get to emit anymore. And if you are going to emit, you have to take it back out. If there's something that's truly hard to abate, you have to take it back out. Governments kind of help with subsidies, all of that stuff, infrastructure. But eventually, you kind of have to get to a place where if you're going to emit, you have to take it back out. And then that creates a really powerful market incentive to drive down the cost of carbon removal because you want to be able to cost effectively remove it. The other thing that's, I think, powerful about that mechanism from a policy perspective is it's almost like a tax on emitting, right? Like if I have to pay to take it back out and it costs $400 a ton, I'm going to do everything I can to not emit it in the first place. Um, so I think there's a few different ways that we get to a, a scale market. There's a lot of conversation around this, but most folks really think at the end of the day, it's going to be policy. It's going to be government supporting building stuff on the supply side and then also saying, hey, you just have to do this. We can't keep polluting the atmosphere. Yeah. And Joe, I mean, $4 a ton of CO2 might be you know, what you and I could pay for it, but the European Union has already, uh, as of 2024, this year, they instituted uh, a kind of a penalty tax on ships that are traveling through EU waters or docking at, U at EU ports of $100 a ton of CO2 emitted by that ship. So the ships are under incredible pressure to mitigate the amount of uh, exhaust that comes out of their smokestack or change their fuels or come up with a methodology that can um, uh, basically negate some of those emissions. It's going, it's going to be a very much market-driven uh, effort, but maybe $100 a ton 
is more is a more reasonable number. That's really interesting. I think, you know, in addition to the markets, I'm, you know, obviously a, a, a psychologist and, you know, a bit of a consumer psychologist at that. I kind of feel like I agree, Anu, with your point about, you know, someone's got to lead and it seems like policy is the most natural place for leadership to happen. But there's still got to be some social license here. People still on sort of the general kind of consumer, general public, general voter side need to buy this, not like buy it with cash, but like buy into it kind of philosophically and morally. And I've, been talking to a lot of folks about this and i've heard people say hey if we if we can do this um isn't it going to disincentivize um decarbonization and i will just kind of address this a little bit you talked about it earlier when you said this is part of a part a portfolio of, of activities but decarbonization of our economies has to be sort of at the, at the heart of this but if you know i can already imagine in the halls of congress you know certain politicians representing, you know, certain political ideologies being like, hey, this is great. In fact, not, I mean, I can't even only imagine. I read about this in the paper. The CEO of Occidental Petroleum said when they bought carbon engineering, um, hey, we can we this gives us social license to drill for oil for the next 150 years because every, you know, CO2 molecule we put in the atmosphere, we're going to be able to draw it back down using carbon dioxide removal. I think when a lot of folks hear that, they're like, hang on a second, this is not what we thought we were talking about, nor is it something that we really want to sign up for, uh, or is it? Yeah, oh man, um, that is a that is the potentially $100 billion question, right? Um, or is the public going to accept, want, provide social license for policy-driven demand? I think... Well, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I would say first and foremost, as a carbon removal professional, I guess, whatever that means, and carbon removal communicator, I want to just keep drilling into this point that reductions must come first. Decarbonization must come first. Anyone who's saying the point of carbon removal is to like keep drilling for oil, uh, they can't hang out with us. Um, that's just not what this is about. And fundamentally, carbon removal is for climate justice. We cause this harm. We need to undo it to the extent that we can. But I think for me, coming from a policy organization, what it really comes down to is really tightly defining what the policy is and what the use case is and tying it to use cases that are actually going to be levers for decarbonization, like what we were talking about with uh, what some folks call a carbon take back obligation or a polluter pays mandate. Uh, there's versions of this floating around in California. There's a version of this that was um, floating around in the EU and their Net Zero Industry Act, where they're saying if you are developing or extracting fossil fuels, you have to actually pay towards building the infrastructure for storage. Um, no one had really talked about that in a policy context before, but we're starting to hear it. We're starting to hear this. If you are polluting, you have an obligation to take that CO2 back out. And I think that's how we build trust with the public that it's really about undoing the harm. It's about addressing concerns that people have that are really real. But the question that I would have for you, Joe, given your experience and, and the engagement work that you've done is, um, how do we build systems that make it clear and accessible to communities that we are actually doing carbon removal, that they can verify this for themselves? Because the really hard thing about carbon removal is there isn't a product. Like It's not like you said you were going to build a house and now there's a house there. Like There's just nothing to see. So how do we, how do we address that? I think about that a lot. Wow, that that is a really fabulous question. Now, now you now there's a lot for me to unpack. So, I, you know, <laughs> the tables have turned. You know, I think, first of all, you know, we have done some research on this, just on the moral hazard question in general, this idea that, you know, if we have this technology, we won't be incentivized to decarbonize. And one of the interesting things we found in our research on that particular point is, hey, I don't think that way. If I asked, you know, person X, hey, do you do you worry about it from this context of we have this technology and that'll disincentivize carbon dioxide? Almost to an individual, people say, no, I don't think like that, but I worry that you think like that. So there's this sort of like blame game around moral hazard, which to me actually makes me worry a whole lot less about it as an impediment to policy. Like if people are all thinking about it that way, then it seems like a pretty light lift to convince people that, hey, you know, like, like you said, Anu and Will, let's decarbonize first and then kind of worry about carbon removal after that. 
The second thing we found in our own research is that if you can, just by some method, take that carbon dioxide and convert it into something usable, people will like that better than if you say, we're just going to store it underground or perhaps in the ocean. And what's interesting there is if we say, hey, imagine a carbon removal company that with only, you know, that, that all they do is put carbon dioxide underground. People generally tend to be pretty leery about that, to your point, Anu. But if we say, hey, there's this company and they put carbon dioxide underground, but they also extract some of that carbon dioxide and make polymers to make plastic, or you know, they can make fuels out of it, like synthetic fuels, suddenly people's perspective changes. It feels a whole lot more entrepreneurial and business-like and sort of forward-looking and perceptions of that industry go way up. But you know, we just can't use that much carbon for stuff. You can only pump so much into Coca-Cola and so then it becomes a question of how do you sort of do it in a way that you sort of, like you said, kind of convince people that we're doing it as sort of a public good. And I think the answer to your question there is, you know, really solid public engagement and not only public engagement, but decision support where people understand why we're doing this and what alternatives we're deploying amongst a suite of decarbonization options. But then secondly, that we that we not only try and convince people that we're actually doing it, but can actually verify that we're actually putting carbon dioxide away, whether it's in the ocean or into, into the earth or into products. And I think this is really at the moment, for me, one of the big undiscovered countries. And how can, how can we like certify that, you know, carbon removal company X is actually delivering on their promise to deliver a certain tonnage of carbon that i'm not really clear on but will it sounds like you might have an answer yeah yeah i'd love to jump on the soapbox on this one there's such an important role for science and such an important role for uh academia science and academia those who are the younger generation moving into this area because what you've hit on is this essential opportunity where science needs to uh make the kinds of measurements that are really going to verify that this CO2 has been removed or converted in a safe way. Science will do that. Scientists are working on this. We're really understanding with CDR methodology A or B or C or D. It has to be verified. It has to be measured. You have to report it accurately. Science loves those terms. Science is geared around addressing that. We really can push this approach, both at USC and through academia in general, I think our college is really embracing this idea that there's an opportunity with CDR that science needs to step forward even more so that the public can trust that, you know, a company A and B says they've removed this much CO2, that, you know, trust, trust people who would, might trust in science again would say, yeah, we believe this is actually happening. And secondly, science can also tell you when you're doing something in the ocean, for example, what I described and what a lot of other groups are doing to the ocean, how much harm is that doing? What are the impacts? And science and oceanographers have always been capable of measuring things in the ocean very carefully, very accurately, understanding how variable ecosystems in the ocean are and, and how they respond to different things. So we really have to jump, you know, head first into this, in my opinion, both at USC and around the globe as scientists to really address the critical uh, questions about monitoring, reporting, and verification, that's MRV, and then impacts. What are the ecological impacts of what it is we're doing? And I and I really, uh, you know, I just think that's sort of a soapbox thing to say here in academia, but I think it's awfully important. I want to so, I, I want to keep going on this. So I know in your in your in, in the bio I read, it sounds like you are working on this MRV question. I spend yeah. a lot of time thinking about the MRV question and the the role of civil society, academia, um, nonprofits in supporting the ecosystem and building trust. Um, I think. There's a couple of things that are important here. First is, what are we using the carbon removal for? 
MRV is functionally a system for accountability, but you have to know who you're holding accountable and what you're holding them accountable for. It makes a difference if you're designing MRV for someone who is literally pulling fossil fuel out of the ground and burning it and saying this carbon removal is compensating for that activity versus uh, say at the jurisdiction level, uh, a state or a country trying to rebuild healthy soils and monitoring at scale if there's carbon in those soils. Those are very different monitoring problems. Um, often we default to an assumption that the only thing that matters is monitoring that looks like the voluntary carbon market, but the voluntary carbon market does not scale. It does not achieve the gigatons of removal we need. So we need to also expand our thinking about what kind of monitoring can we do? How can we do it in a more cost-effective way? Um, and what are the alternatives to just this pure sort of like, can I sell this thing called a credit? Um, but Joe, I had a question for you that was related to this. I think, you know, tying together this MRV question and this trust and social license question, how do we build technical capacity and technical knowledge about carbon removal and the, you know, monitoring and verification of carbon removal in host communities? So for example, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of CDR activity. There's enormous technical knowledge in tribal leadership around fisheries management, but maybe less knowledge about carbon removal and how it works. So like, how should we be thinking about building that capacity? That's a fabulous question. We, we've been doing research in my lab on this question for a while now. And I think the traditional sort of answer to that question is based on something in the decision sciences and in communication that's called the deficit model. People sort of lack information. There's an information deficit. So let's fill up the tank with knowledge and people will just know better and, and you know, be able to participate more effectively. In our own research, what we found is that's true to an extent. There is an information deficit out there, but to really make um, information stick and information usable and information from a wide range of different information sources usable is to engage people with that information in decision making. So that there's this crosstalk now amongst people who might have information deficits, but different kinds of information deficits. So suddenly the, you know, the, the First Nations elder is speaking to the engineer, the engineer is speaking to the business owner, the business owner is speaking to the customer, and people are sort of hearing it from a variety of perspectives and are able to sort of triangulate their knowledge. And then secondly, if you involve those same groups of people and being able to maybe for a, a, an economy or for a business or for a startup, set some priorities around how that company ought to do business, then that information isn't just something that you read or hear, but now it's something that you have to use and it, it becomes a whole lot stickier. So that's kind of my, my take on that. But of course, if you do that, you know, that conversation gets really wide and I think appropriately wide. So there are questions popping up in the chat now. We've addressed a few of them, but, you know, I encourage people to keep bringing them in. But if you're going to talk about sort of talking about the pros and cons in the sort of decision support context, you know, we inevitably have to talk about the MRV question, which we've talked about. We have to talk about the boomerang effects question. Is it safe? Is it safe for the environment? Is it something that we can afford to do? Is it something that we should be doing? Maybe should we be doing geoengineering or something? But I think, you know, I, that's kind of how I look at it. Let's take this from a decision kind of perspective, use information to inform choices, and then be open to the idea of broadening the conversation to account for a portfolio of options on the decarbonization side, but also on this, you know, if you will, kind of carbon removal, climate adaptation side as well. That's my take. I'm sure there are others. I think one thing that you said that really jumps out to me is the crosstalk between different stakeholders and institutions, that it's not one monolithic, like end to end, we do everything and it's carbon removal. It's um, tribal leadership, it's business owners, it's community members, it's local governments getting together. And I think that speaks to a concern that I have about the voluntary carbon market and also an opportunity that I see in the voluntary carbon market, things tend to become highly vertically integrated. That is kind of the business model that works, um, but that also leads to a lot of financial conflicts of interest, right? The same person writing the rules is also getting paid to check if someone met the rules and they're selling the credits on the back end. Um, and it also excludes these more rich and robust and capacity building decision-making architectures. And so I think a lot about how can we start separating out these functions? How can we provide the appropriate information to appropriate stakeholders to have a more robust conversation and also to increase the supply of institutions that are feeding into this process. Well, I'm curious, what do you wish people knew about carbon removal? I mean, you're you're sort of, you know, working in this space as a researcher, clearly you, you think about what people think of this as a, as a engineering enterprise, but also as, you know, as product of your work. 
Yeah, I mean, Joe, I, I love to promote with people, uh, not maybe, you know, not in this area. They promote the, um, the understanding that the earth has a mechanism uh, already in place that mitigates CO2. And then if we can, if we could capitalize on that process and potentially speed it up, I think that makes a lot of sense, perhaps, to a lot of people. The ocean as a repository of this excess CO2 is just a very, you know, well-known fact that this is where excess uh, CO2 uh, goes in a geologic sense. It could go there in a in a uh, in a mitigation way as well, if we were, you know, careful about how we did that. The Earth system has a very good mechanism for dealing with excess CO2 is my is one of my points. And I, if I could answer one of these questions that we've received, um, when policy seems to work, uh, it was when we had to get rid of the acid from sulfa, sulfur in, in gases that were being emitted by, by uh, burning fossil fuels. And that sulfur turned into sulfuric acid and created acid rain. The policies were established and and within a few years, the sulfur was removed by by pretty simple, straightforward mechanisms that took took the other sulfurs out of the out of the emissions, and it really made a big difference in the uh, in the uh, ecosystem, you know, recovery from this acid rain pro problem. There are ways that, that there are times, at least examples of which uh, of of policies that work on these hard environmental problems. That's that's one example of that. But I'm glad you brought that up because there's another question in the chat about, about our thoughts on a carbon tax. And the minute I read a question like that, to me, and I'm not suggesting that the person who raised this question is thinking about it this way, but to me, I immediately think of like politicization. This is one of those like trap questions to separate the, the R's from the D's. I kind of feel like you know, when it comes to what you're talking about, Will and Anu, the the sulfurs, the acid rain, maybe even the ozone stuff, that didn't seem to be quite as politicized as climate change is these days. So is is that is that really a a, a useful analogy for what we're confronting now, just given how polarized a society we live in? And I don't know who can answer that question, but I'm throwing it out there. And Anu can answer that question. Ouch. Um, so I think one thing that's really interesting and important to note about carbon removal is that it has had over the last five, eight years, really bipartisan support. Um, there's something about it. There's lots of places you can do carbon removal, lots of resources, inputs, opportunities. Um, the National Labs just put out this uh, Roads to Removal report that looks at the county level where there's carbon removal opportunities, and it's basically everywhere. Um, so for carbon removal politicization, um, the, the outlook is actually has been and, and continues to be quite good. There's a lot of opportunities for a lot of people. Um, that said, on the carbon tax piece, yeah, the U.S. that's always going to be tough. I think what I think about a lot is what are some more tailored specific um, industries, specific um, opportunities to embed carbon removal in existing policies and infrastructure. So less like monolithic carbon tax and more, here's places where we could just start doing the work. We can start creating proof points that build to bigger policies. Um, and last thing I would say on a carbon tax is um, maybe the, the US federal government going full hog on a carbon tax, not in our immediate future, but there are a lot of companies that are talking about internal carbon taxes. So switching from, uh, we're gonna offset our scope three with $4 per ton trees that probably aren't a real thing anyway, to an internal carbon tax, really trying to keep track of their own emissions using existing industry-wide standards, and then putting that money into innovation, things like purchasing innovative carbon removal solutions, and I would really encourage anyone who's thinking about this, um, who's working at a company that has a sustainability policy, that has a net zero policy, to think about things like an internal carbon tax and um, or an internal carbon fee and what you can do to support innovation. It's really interesting. I was at a... Uh... I was part of a conversation. I won't say where or with whom. All I'll say it was it was that it wasn't at USC, but it was uh, it was a conversation about the overhead rates we pay at universities. So when you get a research grant at a university, you pay a certain amount of overhead to the university to keep the lights on and keep our labs equipped and so on and so forth. 
Um, and we introduced this idea of a carbon tax on overhead, that there were certain sciences that weren't as carbon intensive, so they should have a lower overhead rate. Others might have a higher overhead rate. And it didn't go over so well. People started to sort of, you know, scream and yell about equity. But it also reminds me of when I was a science advisor to the administrator of the EPA under the George W. Bush administration. Yes, that's how old I am. Um, there was a conversation about, you know, a nickel extra on a on a tank of gas to pay for some um, some environmental initiatives. And we were told back then when gas was like $1.50 a gallon on average, that a five cent extra on a gallon of gas would like crush the economy. Maybe I'm being naive, but it just sort of seems like these kinds of very modest fees, uh, premiums, taxes, if you will, could actually work. Like I bet you a few pennies on a gallon of gas could pay for a lot of the not only the R&D on carbon removal, but a lot of the early term implementation that helps to scale. Why aren't we just doing that? It seems like table stakes at this point. Well, I, I can't say why we're not doing that, Joe, but I mean, there's a lot of politics, policy wrapped into the drama of a heat wave, extraordinary heat, extraordinary flooding, extraordinary droughts, extraordinary wildfires, extraordinary damage from cyclones red and blue states are hit equally and you know what katrina did uh, politically speaking it really did change things we we are you know all together in this and i think there will be some way to all pull together uh to try to get us out of this that's that's Wow, Will, that's a very hopeful, you know, perspective. Not that I'm surprised that it's coming from you, but I'm just happy to hear it. Anu, we're running out of time. Um, do you wanna do you wanna one up Will on hope? Oh my god. At least try to um, tie him. I think, Anu for the tie, maybe the win. I will I will attempt to. I think um the the thing that I love about working in carbon removal is that it is almost necessarily naively optimistic. We were trying to do this crazy thing of sucking carbon back out of the atmosphere at you know roughly 400 ppm, running uphill against thermodynamics, and we're doing it for climate justice. Like there's this whole industry of people that are switching out of lucrative tech careers, out of academic, like all all sorts of places all over the world. We're like, we need to do this, and we're just gonna we're just gonna start building, and we're gonna make it happen. Um, and I, I love that. So I think there's a lot to be optimistic about in the field of carbon removal right now. Uh, and I would agree with you. I've, I've seen it myself. I've seen people in academia jumping on the entrepreneurial bandwagon like uh, like Will and being very successful at it. I've seen people in policy from the right side of the aisle and the left coming together, as you said, Anu, around carbon removal. I've seen agreements between the EU and Europe and uh, sorry, in North America and Asia happening. So I agree. I think there's something magical about this. And I think it it's magical because it kind of feels like not only kind of a, the morally kind of right thing to do, but it sort of feels like kind of the like the next moonshot. Like we can all kind of rally around something. There's some, you got to build some things. It, it kind of looks cool. You know, it's something that we can all kind of get behind for a variety of reasons. And if we can find a way to pay for it and then, you know, ultimately support it so much, the better. So I tend to be pretty hopeful as well. And maybe on that note, we should call it a day. I mean, we're all pretty hopeful. I've learned a lot. Hopefully people who have watched uh, have learned a lot. Uh, Will, Anu, I can't thank you enough. Thank you to the Dornzeit College for putting on these dialogues. And with that, I think we'll sign off. Goodbye, everybody.